Tonight, Israeli soldiers stormed the biggest functioning hospital in Gaza. The IDF says it was a precise and limited operation, but that's not how it feels for the doctors and patients caught up in the chaos and machine gunfire. We are attacked by Israeli army at the hospital. One person has reportedly been killed. Some medics had to flee, leaving the seriously ill behind. Also tonight... We have another person that uh, they call, like, uh, we will bomb you and all of that. Like, so immediately, I, I, in one case as well, I closed the restaurant. The Jewish community is living in fear after a global rise in anti-Semitism since October the 7th. Plus... What is it going to take for you to help make sure violence like this stops happening? I'll speak live to the father who had his son's voice recreated using AI in an attempt to change gun laws. This evening, we'll also be talking about space, a new battleground and a new frontier. That's after the revelation of a new Russian nuclear weapon designed to threaten America's satellite network. And why it could soon become even harder to spot what's real and what's fake online? That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Good evening. Precise and limited. Those were the words Israeli forces used to describe their military offensive on the biggest functioning hospital in southern Gaza today. Last night, we showed you the images of hundreds of families who'd sought shelter there, heading south to the city of Rafa. The IDF says patients and staff were not obliged to leave and that medics could continue treating the most seriously ill. This is what happened next. Medical staff rushing people on stretchers through a corridor filled with smoke and dust as gunfire rings out. At least one person was killed and six others wounded. More victims of the deadly fallout from October the 7th. And since those attacks by Hamas last year, Jewish groups have warned of a sharp increase in anti-Jewish abuse, with this being described as a watershed moment. We'll discuss that huge global spike in anti-Semitism in a moment, Let's get started with this report from Sky's Diana Magne in Jerusalem. Inside the Nasser Hospital, there is dust and debris and what sounds like burst water pipes. Imagine how frightening this must be. Listen to how frightening it is. We are attacked by Israel army at the hospital. Is there anybody still inside? The doctor keeps calling out. Other voices yell for stretchers. And then there is gunfire. Shooting, shooting, get your head down, he says. This was Mohammed Harara earlier in the week, warning of how dire things were even as he continued to treat the injured. We are uh, very afraid to be arrested by the uh, Israel army because uh, they are uh, surrounding us uh, in every direction at uh, the hospital. We've collected video from several doctors' social media accounts documenting the chaos of Israel's early morning raid. Uh, my people is uh, so scaring that uh, we'll be killed here in Nasser Hospital because Israel army has surrounded the hospital and we can't go out. In the corridors of the orthopaedic wing, people scrambling to move the immobilised and get the bedridden out of harm's way. Israel says they want the hospital to keep functioning and that their operation was worth it. I can now share some of the terrorists who took part in the massacre of October 7th. They were found by our forces inside the Nasser Hospital complex. These doctors, though, who'd held out at the hospital for so long, felt they no longer could. It is our journey to Rafah, to the Kuwait Hospital. 
So look, look at that. Khan Yunus to Rafa, swapping one war zone for another. Dr. Harara on the right. Just one phrase on his Instagram. Thank God. That was Diana Magne reporting there. Well, here in the UK, the charity which provides protection for British Jews has spoken of what's described as an explosion of hatred after a record rise in anti-Semitism. Well, the Community Security Trust says there were more than 4,000 anti-Jewish hate incidents in the UK last year, 66% of them after October the 7th. That trend is a global one. The Jewish Agency for Israel says there was a 235% spike last year compared with 2022. Shingi Marurike reports. Ben used to see his kosher pizza shop as a safe space for him and the community he serves. An idea that was shattered last year when someone called with this threat. We will bomb you and all of that. Like, so immediately, I, I, in one case as well, I closed the restaurant earlier on. Like we closed the restaurant at 4 o'clock instead of 10 o'clock because they said you need to evacuate the building. I called the police, get the police in, do the checks that just to make sure that we're safe. I don't want to uh, put anyone in danger, not my customers, not my staff, uh, not myself as well. His experiences part of a record rise in anti-Semitism, its impact being felt across the country, especially in some of Britain's biggest Jewish communities, like here in North Manchester, causing anxiety and anger among community leaders. I'm annoyed that we are being made to feel like this, that we are made to be intimidated, that we don't want to walk out on our streets, that people are having to cover up identifiable signs of being Jewish. We're proud to be British Jews. We play a huge part in this country. And for us to feel like this, because of something that happened thousands of miles away, is unacceptable. Free, free Palestine! Free, free a conflict Palestine. in the Middle East is free, fracturing free British Palestine. society. One, two, At the University of Leeds and on campuses and cities across the country, pro-Palestine protests are now regular. The organisers we spoke to condemned anti-Semitism. But Jewish students here say they've faced discrimination on campus. Every morning I wake up and I don't know if I should put on my, my yamaki, my skull cap. I don't know if I should do it because maybe this day I'll get attacked. An atmosphere Jamie says is only becoming more hostile. I've had swastikas drawn on, on the cars on my road. Um, in lectures, I know a lot of students have, had to, have felt really uncomfortable uh, listening to things that their lecturers have said and they've had to you know, walk out of, of seminars and lectures. Back in Manchester at this synagogue, a space for prayer, positivity and reflection has needed extra security. But the rabbi remains optimistic. My general confidence in our society at the moment is not necessarily being borne out. Um, my hope is that things will return to where they should be. Faith is one thing, but the facts are stark. Anti-Semitism across society is rising at an alarming rate. Shinki Marike, Sky News, Manchester. Well, joining me here in the studio is our studio guest and our panellists for uh, this evening, Tara Kangalu, global affairs journalist and author, and Don David Guttenplan, editor of The Nation. Thank you both for joining us here on the programme. Um, Don, I'll begin with you. I mean, 235% rise in anti-Semitism. In Britain, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, this happens every time there's... That was actually globally. Oh, globally? Yeah, yeah. OK. Well... First of all, figures on anti-Semitism rely on self-reporting, so they always have to be taken with a certain grain of salt. But, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you that after October 7th, one of my family members put on a Jewish star and started wearing it around London. Uh, and this is someone whose main political engagement and main Jewish engagement was Jewish Voices for Peace, which mm -hmm. is to say a pro-Palestinian group. And they've still had comments on the tube. So, you know, Anecdotally, yes, and certainly this is a pattern. On the other hand, Jews in London and Jews in New York are still a lot safer than Jews in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So, you know, it's important to put it into context. You know, Yalda, my thought on this is any time a group is, is judged and labeled but because of their faith, that's wrong. Right. And if we want to take that further, any time that group is judged and labeled because of the behavior of a group, 
or a government or regime that's wrong, right? You know I'm Iranian, and I have firsthand experience as an Iranian, right? When categorically Iranians are judged because of the behavior of a the rogue regime. regime, right? And I and I find that troubling. And when that happens, that takes away the opportunity for any constructive discourse and engagement. And I think that's dangerous. Well, that's but that's how bigotry works. Yes, I mean, it's like judging people because they're because they're Jews for the actions of the Netanyahu government is no more sensible than judging Muslims after 7-7 or after 9-11. Absolutely. You know, and we're seeing it. We're seeing it online. We're mm -hmm. seeing it on university campuses. Absolutely. We're seeing it sort of, uh, you know, how polarized our world has become. Well, emotions are very high. And, you know, uh, and both sides of this feel very strongly. You know, there are, there are Jews whose identities are very wrapped up with Israel, and they feel that you know the legitimacy of the state or the project is being attacked. And on the other hand, you know, many, many, many people are watching the murder of Palestinians every day on television and becoming enraged. Mm. And all of those re responses are understandable, but they're not, you know, that whether it's shouting at somebody on the street or, you know, committing graffiti on a synagogue or whether it's calling somebody a name because they're, you know, wearing a, a headscarf. Mm. None of that is going to make the world a safer or a more peaceful place. So. Indeed. I mean, you're an uh, adjunct professor at Georgetown University. You see it on yes. campus yes. all the time. Yes, it's interesting. I remember the Tuesday uh, after the, the atrocities of October 7th and I went to class and I don't cover you know, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the history in, in my classroom. But every single student wanted to talk about this. But you know, Yalda, Don, everyone was afraid. No one had the right words. Everyone was, was sort of on the edge. How do they go about it, right? And when you talk to faculty and when you talk to colleagues, they don't know how to go about it well, as people well. people are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Yeah. People are yeah. afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're afraid of getting canceled or, realistically, in some New York campuses, getting expelled. Yeah. You know, there were... I mean, and that's the thing. There are groups that were doxing students because they participated in pro-Palestinian demonstrations. And it, it's become, you know, there's been a real suppression of speech on campus, particularly around this issue. And it, I have to say that the suppression of speech has landed much harder on Palestinian students than on Jewish students. And, and you know, lastly, I would say again, you know, harboring hate is, is very easy on the basis of faith and labeling people. But what's difficult is, is to foster empathy and engagement and dialogue. And I could see within the younger generation, at least my students at Georgetown, one of the you know, leading institutions um, in, in the US, students want to talk, they want to engage, they need the right tools to come together and space to have a healthy, um, uh, empathetic discussion without labeling, without judging, without um, without hate, and that but, has but, been difficult. But unfortunately, difficult. I mean, these issues are always simmering under the surface, mm. aren't they? And they do rear their ugly heads when, when something happens, when something big yes. globally happens. Well, there's a, you know, anti-Semitism is a very old prejudice. I mean, we're sitting here talking about this in England, mm. In 1190, there was a massacre in York. There was a massacre the same year in Norwich. In 1290, all the Jews in Britain were expelled from the country. You know, that had nothing to do with the Middle East. It's a, it's a very old prejudice, and it persists. Um, and it, and it, it reappears. And it reappears, and people, and people seize on moments of, you know, tension and particularly conflict in the Middle East to express prejudices that they've always had or always harbored. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's there. Yeah. That's why I believe in, in the power of, of engagement, of storytelling, of people-to-people -people dialogue. Because I don't think there's any more powerful way of you and I agreeing to disagree in an amicable, respectful, empathetic way if we know each other, if we understand each other's values, and ultimately understand we don't necessarily want different things than one but another. But the spaces where that can happen, I think, are getting fewer and yes, fewer. I think it's very hard to have those kinds of conversations about this issue now. Well, so many other issues that we're also going to talk about, including this one, which divides and polarizes people as well on the program. We'll keep you here with us. Uh, Don, Tara, so far, thank you so much. Now, stay with me, because coming up, I'm going I'm to a meet a parent who has agreed to help give a voice back to victims of gun violence.
I'm Greg Milam and I'm Sky's Chief North of England Correspondent. I've reported from around the world and around the UK. I'm Mark Stone, I'm Sky's US Correspondent based here in Washington DC. And beyond the United States, from across the world, I report on the biggest stories. I'm Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's Chief Correspondent. I'm David Blevins and I'm Sky's Senior Ireland Correspondent. I remember some of the worst of the violence here. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's Special Correspondent based in Istanbul. There's always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. In the United States, members of Congress have been receiving voice messages from victims of gun violence, including children who were killed in some of the worst mass shootings in American history. Their families have given permission for their voices to be uh, recreated by artificial intelligence as part of a powerful campaign for tougher gun controls. Hi, this is Uzi Garcia. Ten-year-old Uzi dreamed of being a superhero. <laughs> but he was one of 19 children and two teachers shot dead in the Uvalde school shooting in Texas in 2022. The teenage gunman used a semi-automatic rifle he'd been legally able to buy at the age of 18. What is it going to take for you to help make sure violence like this stops happening? Uzi's voice has been recreated by artificial intelligence and along with the voices of five others was used in phone calls to members of Congress urging them to toughen U.S. gun laws. The U.S. has one of the highest rates of deaths by gun violence in the world. Last year, more than 40,000 people were shot dead, according to the Gun Violence Archive. And so far this year, almost 5,000 people have died. It's been six years and you've done nothing. Not a thing to stop all the shootings that have continued to happen since. 
17-year-old Joaquin Oliver was one of 17 people shot dead in the Parkland school shooting in Florida on Valentine's Day in 2018. How many calls will it take for you to care? How many dead voices will you hear before you finally listen? The 19-year-old gunman was able to legally buy the semi-automatic weapon despite a history of mental health problems. It's notoriously difficult to change U.S. gun laws because of the powerful gun lobby. A tearful President Obama issued what he described as common-sense executive actions after a series of mass shootings, including at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012. Every time I think about those kids, it gets me mad. But he failed to get legislation through the Senate that would have banned assault weapons and required background checks. This campaign is a desperate one. Families hope it will renew the pressure on Congress to act. That's why my family recreated my voice using AI to call you today and demand change. Ending that report uh, with 10-year-old Uzi's voice. Joining me now is Brett Cross, whose son Uzi was among the 19 children. Uh, 19 children and two children killed in the Uvalde uh, school shooting in 2022. Thank you so much, uh, Brett, for joining us. It's always difficult, I can imagine. I mean, I can't imagine, actually, to, to hear your son's voice there um, being recreated by AI. Yes, ma'am. It, it is. Uh, it's heartbreaking that we have to do this. But, you know, as I said yesterday, we've been his voice for the past 632 days. And yesterday he was able to have his voice, you know, share his message. And so it is it, it's hard to every time I hear it, it it's so difficult. But all he ever wanted to do was to help people. And this way he will end up helping people. And, you know, just tell us a little bit more about this Shotline campaign. Um, obviously, we've, you've used um, Uzi's voice there, but, but just a little bit more about what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, so, you know, at, on the shotline.org, um, I mean, it takes 10 seconds to do it. You just click on a kid to hear their story, and then you type in your the area in which you're at, the zip code, and then it brings up the politicians that are over your area and so we're hoping to flood these lines and make sure that they hear our kids voices you know we've been i've been doing this for almost two years now um the olivers have been doing this for the past six and i feel like these politicians are just ignoring us at this point they're not listening so you know, are they going to listen to our kids? Are they going to listen to the voices of children that could have been here had they enacted just common sense gun laws? And yesterday, again, we saw another shooting. I, I mean, you know, despite all of these calls, Americans continue to die. No, absolutely. Um, while we were in D.C. yesterday, there was a standoff which three cops were shot. Um, then the Kansas City Chiefs parade had a mass shooting. And then there was a high school in Atlanta that had a mass shooting. Three different mass shootings in one day. On the same day that we launched this campaign, six years after Parkland. And I don't understand if enough people are not seeing how messed up it is here. Because we're trying to get these politicians to move and to work on something because in america it's not a matter of if it's going to happen to you it's a matter of when and we're trying to prevent that we're trying to prevent that for these politicians kids but they just do not see it so it, it's kind of crazy that we had three mass shootings on the same day and yet the the gun lobbies remain as powerful as ever mm -hmm. yeah it, it's it's blood money um and that's that's the bottom line. And these politicians, you know, take this blood money from the NRA, from the gun lobby, and they continue to push out this propaganda and these agendas that, yeah, good guys with a gun stop bad guys with a gun. Except the only thing that is common in all of these shootings is a gun. You know, they're not focusing and facing the actual problems they're masking it and they're getting away with it because we can't even sue gun manufacturers. 
What would you now like to... I mean, I, I can see how painful it is every time you hear uh, Uzi's voice, but you've decided to go ahead and do this. What do you ultimately hope will be achieved? What, what the end outcome of this will be? You know, all we want is for not another child to go through this. We don't want another parent to have to pick out which cartoon character is going to be on their 10 year old's coffin. You know, these are these are things that we've had to go through. These are things that all of these other families have gone through. And the, the bottom line is we don't want this happening anymore. We don't we want these politicians and this government to put our kids above this money, because at the end of the day, you can make all the money you want but you don't leave with it. Our kids left with absolutely nothing. Brett, we're so grateful for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, let's uh, bring our panelists back in, uh, Tara and Don. I mean, Tara, it's so difficult to listen to uh, what that one family is going through, one of, of thousands, tens of thousands. 100%. And Yalda, I remember actually when Sandy Hook happened, I was in the newsroom and I covered it very closely. And I remember then President Obama's reaction. And, and you know, this was sort of my first uh, mass shooting uh, that, I, that I unfortunately had to cover as a journalist. And I thought, you know, something's going to happen. Something's going to change. And every day in America, we see something similar happening, and and you know you mentioned the numbers, but it's but it's but it's fascinating that last year, 2023, six, over 600 mass shootings, more more than the days of the year, twice a day, and and that is dangerous. But I, if if I may, I want to take it a step further. It is about gun control laws. It's about gun issues. It's about gun issues. But also, I do believe that we need to look at mental health issue, and 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 ask ourselves why is it that teenagers and and people pick up a gun and go on on such horrific assaults? And that is part of the discussion. And I hope it becomes um, entwined with uh, with 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 the work that's being done to hopefully one day say enough is enough. Well, just to pick up on what Tara was saying there. Every time something like this, something horrific happens, we hear leaders come out and say, Joe Biden, for example, yesterday said, this should shock us, it should shame us. And yet nothing, no, nothing ever happens. Nothing happens. No, and you, I remember also watching Obama make that yeah. speech and thinking maybe something mm. will change. I thought after Sandy Hook, something would change. And, you know, no parent can watch what we just watched without feeling gutted by it. I mean, it's just terrible. I, I would disagree with one thing that you said, though, which is I don't think that the gun lobby is as powerful as ever. I mean, Wayne LaPierre, who is the head of the NRA, is on trial now for fraud and embezzlement. Mm -hmm. It would be a great time to kick them while they're down. Mm. And, you know, and I think you could get political mileage out of doing it. Do you think uh, that's uh, the case? Things uh, are shifting uh, and changing? Uh, I don't feel confident responding on that, but but I do agree when when powers are weak, it's time to kick and change something. But Yalda, what I would say is on big issues in the U.S., it always becomes a, a partisan issue. It always becomes a political tug of war. And, 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 and policymakers and politicians fail to see the human toll, whether it's the opioid crisis, whether it's, you know, gun issues, you know, abortion. It becomes a political issue and it takes away from the humanity and the, and the, the human tragedy that we're talking about. And if we talk about the human tragedy, I mean, just last year, 40,000 people were shot dead. That's according yeah. to Gun Violence Archive. So far this year, we're into February. Right. 5,000 people have died. So we're on pace to break the record, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the other thing you have to realize is that lots of other con countries have guns, other countries had mass shootings, and they did something about Australia. it. Australia. Australia, mm. Scotland. You know, that, that it, it's not like we have to figure out how to prove Fermat's last theorem to solve this. We know what will solve this. It's true that there is a mental health crisis in America. It's true that private health provision in America means it's much harder to get help. But it's also true that there are more guns than there are people in yes. America. So if you, you know, if you're having mental health problems, picking up a gun is so much easier there than it is anywhere else. And really when they say sensible gun legislation, what they mean is not taking guns away from people. What they mean is making it a little harder for an angry teenager to go out and, and get a gun and get ammunition and kill his classmates. What's also extraordinary is when you hear about small children being taught how to deal 
with a mass These shooting. These yeah. mass shooter drills, it's just... The drills yeah, are just... It's, it's, it's terrifying. Just terrible. It's terrible. I mean, I remember when I got an email, um, you know, teaching, in, you know, at the university that I teach about uh, contingency plans when in case of a shooting. You know, and I'm an adult, and as an educator, that's troubling. So can you then just imagine a 10-year-old? Ten yeah, let alone old. somebody who's in charge of a class of 25, six-year-olds and has to figure out, you know, how, are we going to hide in the closet? Are, gonna, are they going to stay under the desk? Am I, gonna, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is just, it's insane. And I, and I think that's why it's worth investing in, in preventing, you know, these violences to occur whilst focusing on, you know, policy making and, and working with politicians for uh, stricter gun regulations. That's why I think uh, working with youngsters from a young age, uh, addressing the signs, you know, if, if some kid is vulnerable, why are teenagers so so angry or why are they susceptible to such behavior? I think uh, it's, it's a responsibility of all of us, parents, educators, to also look out for signs and not isolate uh, students and teenagers and kids who need that support to, God forbid, you know, one day, uh, you know, they, they pick up a gun and go on a rampage. Well, so it's we, a responsibility. You have to make it harder people. for them to get a gun. Yes. In the first place. Don, Tara, thank you so much. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up. <laughs> Is Russia really developing nuclear weapons to use in space? Congress has described the plans as a serious national security threat, but Moscow has denied all such claims. What would be the impact of a nuclear space race?
Welcome back. Could Russia put a nuclear weapon into space? Moscow says reports suggesting they could are a fabrication. But it's a question getting a lot of attention in the United States right now. Sources have told our partners NBC that a weapon is being developed and that it could put US satellites in danger. What would that mean for the security of Americans? Here's our US correspondent, James Matthews. 24 hours on in Washington, D.C., they're still talking about a threat beyond the clouds. In space, where modern warfare has gone before, and reportedly, Putin is going again. But whatever the truth is out there, down here, details had been put on the ground. I can confirm that it is related to an anti-satellite capability that Russia is developing. Now, there is more. First, this is not an active capability that's been deployed. And though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. We are not talking about a weapon that can be used to attack human beings or cause physical destruction here on Earth. Weaponry in space is nothing new. The American politicians who first leaked news of this development had spoken of a serious national security threat. The worry is about the risk faced by the global network of satellites, over 8,000 of them. In orbit now, the number used for communication stands at over 4,500. They include Elon Musk's Starlink network. Satellites looking down on the Earth number more than 2,000, including hundreds of military craft. And there are more than 300 navigation satellites, powering everything from maps on our phones to global shipping. The major concern is that a Russian nuclear-powered satellite could use its energy stores to send a pulse of electromagnetic energy, frying the circuits of Western satellites with the aim of leaving Russia's intact. These are pictures of Russia's defence minister visiting a company producing electronic warfare systems designed for space. What makes more sense is the possibility of some sort of space-based jammer. That is to say, a satellite that may get up close to other satellites and try and interfere with the signals coming from them, and that perhaps there's a nuclear power source for part of that. Moscow has dismissed the claims as a ruse to engineer U.S. support for aid to Ukraine. America is consulting its allies. Well, I take all these things very seriously. You wouldn't expect me to comment on this individual report this morning. Britain has a nuclear deterrent, which is a credible deterrent. The Americans were bounced into revealing details of developments by leaks from their own politicians. The Biden administration has said the preferred way forward was private engagement. It now proceeds amidst a very public concern. James Matthews, Sky News, in Washington. Well, joining me now is Heather Williams, Director of the Project on Nuclear Issues at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. Thanks so much, uh, Heather, for joining us here on the programme. How worried should we be? I think it's too soon to say. Uh, the information on this has been pretty slow to come out and we still don't have the full picture. Uh, I think the press conference earlier today that you showed in the opening um, gave us a lot more information that we now know this is an anti-satellite capability. Um, but another piece of the puzzle that got put together uh, was when John Kirby said that this would be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. This is a 1967 treaty that prohibits deployment of any weapons of mass destruction in space. So, and I think that's one of the biggest indicators we have so far um, that this ha does have some sort of a nuclear weapon component to it. So if that Just proves to be true and as we get Get more information, um, we, we probably should uh, start to be a little concerned and have a lot more questions. So uh, say, for example, it is a nuclear weapon in space, what would that do? So it would do a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, if it was actually used in space, it would wipe out all the satellites um, uh, in, that were within range. This could include communication satellites, intelligence related satellites. We have just become so dependent on these satellites for everything that we do in our lives. It's not just you know the militaries that are using them. Obviously, there's Starlink, uh, there's communication satellites. So it would really be disruptive if they were actually, if it was a nuclear weapon and was used for those purposes. The other thing that I want to stress is that um, if this is a nuclear weapon that has been deployed or will be deployed into space, it does violate this treaty that John Kirby mentioned. And this is one of the last remaining nuclear treaties that we really have with Russia. Russia has cheated on or withdrawn from all its other arms control. And, and, and uh, uh, Heather, part. I mean, if it is violated, what does that mean? 
I mean, can Russia just violate it and, and there are no sort of penalties other than, I guess, sanctions? It's really up to the international community what it means for Russia. In the past, Russia has cheated on agreements and had not suffered major repercussions. The United States has certainly indicated that this is a very escalatory behavior, that Russia is the one violating these agreements. But it's going to be a lot more for the international community that we're going to need them to do to uh, demonstrate to Russia and to tell Russia that we just won't accept this escalatory behavior or nuclear bullying anymore. Um, I guess what this does speak to, Heather, is how important uh, space is becoming militarily and for, for national security. Absolutely. The war in Ukraine has really demonstrated that and the importance of Starlink to the Ukrainians. For example, it might look like a quote unquote old fashioned war with tanks and guns on the ground, but all of that is heavily dependent on space and um, space based assets that Ukraine in particular is relying on. So um, space has really become an integral part of modern warfare. You're absolutely right. Heather Williams, uh, we're really grateful for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. A pioneering mission to the moon is now underway after a technical glitch halted the first attempt. A private U.S. lunar lander successfully launched from NASA's base in Florida. A spacecraft, which is attached to a SpaceX rocket, is aiming to land on the moon's south pole. If all goes to plan, it would be the first American touchdown since the last Apollo mission half a century ago. Our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, has more. Ignition and liftoff. Go SpaceX, go IM-1 and the Odysseus Lunar Lander. A routine launch for SpaceX, but the start of an epic journey for the Odysseus spacecraft on board. Its destination is the unexplored south pole of the moon, a region pockmarked with boulders and craters. It will attempt a hazardous landing on its own in eight days' time. It's a very uh, undulating terrain and uh, with a very little deviation off of your planned landing site, you could end up in the dark at freezing temperatures. We needed to develop a, uh, a precision landing and hazard avoidance uh, system to be able to land on the, on the South Pole. Success would make this the first U.S. moon landing in more than half a century. This time it's water, not the Cold War driving the lunar dash. At the University of Manchester, scientists have found water molecules in rock brought back by Apollo astronauts. But in craters at the pole, there's likely to be much more. The moon's been bombarded by asteroids, comets, um, the solar wind, galactic um, cosmic rays for four and a half billion years. Uh, it's got nothing to protect it. And so over these four and a half billion years, it's accumulated probably significant quantities of water ice. And because these craters are so cold, once it's there, it's just trapped there. Odysseus will test navigational and communications equipment that will make future missions less risky. In a few weeks' time, another spacecraft will drill for water, preparing for the return of humans to the moon as soon as 2026. Finding water on the moon would be a game changer, not just for astronauts to drink, but split the water molecule and you have oxygen to breathe and hydrogen to make rocket fuel. It makes a permanent moon base much more realistic. But half of all missions to the moon's surface have ended in failure. Improving the odds is critical before sending astronauts, and Odysseus is a big test of what will be needed. Thomas Moore, Sky News. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up, I'll be speaking to the unexpected star of the Africa Cup of Nations. You may be surprised to hear it wasn't a footballer. Story of resilience, but it's also a, a story of, you know, me developing as a person and, you know, um, it wasn't the end of the world when I stepped away from rowing <laughs> previously, you know, and I, I went on to, you know, be a bit more uh, connected at home and, uh, you know, get a full time job. And I think I think in a strange way, I, I, I developed, you know, um, a bit more resilience. And, you know, this time when I came back from the opportunity, I, I was ready for it and I knew what to expect. So it really helped me, you know, get back in the groove quickly. You talk very openly about the loss of your legs and having to walk again, yeah. learning to walk again with, with prosthetic legs and that difficult period and leaving the military. When you look back, how do you think you got through that? 
Yeah, I think I think for me, I, I lost that social connection. I didn't realise this at the time, but that's what was missing. You know, it was uh, I, I missed that social identity. And I think once I started getting back in the gym and you know engaging with sports and things like the Invictus Games, you know, it really just helped me you know, boost that self-esteem, you know, become more comfortable within my own skin, learn more about my disability, you know, push the boundaries of what I was capable of. And it all sort of culminated in in, in me just being much happier and, you know, up, up for the challenge again. You know, I kind of found that old Greg, the commando Greg, you know, that I lost for a little while. Um, so, yeah, as soon as I stumbled into rowing, <laughs> I was like, wow, this is difficult, but it suited me down to the ground. And what are the lessons for other people, people going through things, as you've gone through things, what, what are the lessons you think your experiences and, and where you've got to now and where you're going to next can, yeah. can, can inform I, other people? I think it's about not giving up. Uh, you know, right, right back from my, you know, the, the, the early days of the commando course, you, you, you know, I, I, I developed uh, the skill of not always being the best at everything. You know, I had to drop the ego and you know, do what I was told and learn the techniques. And, you know, I was, I was a very competent runner, but I wasn't particularly strong in my upper body. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I had to learn quickly. I had to reframe the way I looked at tasks. And I would say that's really you know, help me move forward with my acquired disability. It's helped me in sport. It's about not being scared to make mistakes and, you know, taking one step at a time and really, you know, letting that full journey, you know, take place. Don't try and, you know, jump to the, the, the fifth step before you've completed the first one. I've been guilty of that a few times, <laughs> you know, so trust me from experience. <laughs> Welcome back to the programme. We begin with some breaking news, which has just come in, that uh, Greece has become the first Christian Orthodox majority country to legalise same-sex marriage. Um, so that means that same-sex couples will now also be legally allowed to adopt children uh, after today's vote. Uh, the Greek Prime Minister has said that the new law would boldly abolish uh, serious inequality. Um, so that's the uh, Greek Parliament approving a bill which allows same-sex uh, civil marriage, a victory uh, for supporters of uh, LGBT rights. The law gives same-sex couples a right to wed and, as I said, adopt children and comes after decades of campaigning by the LGBT community for marriage equality in um, this socially conservative country. It's become the first uh, orthodox majority country to legalize same-sex marriage. The bill was approved by 176 lawmakers in the 300 seat parliament and will become law when it's published in the official government gazette. So a lot of celebrations there in Greece. Now, ChatGPT brought home the power of AI. Tonight, the company who made it have released details about a new project, Sora. And I'll be honest, it's a little bit scary. It works like ChatGPT. You give it a prompt and rather than creating uh, your CV for you or a long essay, it produces a 60 second video. It's not yet released to the public, but what happens when it is? Well, here's some of those videos and the prompts that produce them. Have a look. Now, this AI video of dogs was created with the prompt, a, little, uh, a litter of golden retriever puppies playing in the snow. Their heads pop out of the snow, covered in it. The prompt for this video was a beautiful homemade video showing the people of Lagos, Nigeria, in the year 2056. 
A detailed description of a grandma would get you this video. And finally, just a, a short description of a 24-year-old woman's blinking eye standing in Marrakesh, and you get this. Well, let's bring in our studio guests, Tara and Don. I mean, they look quite realistic. It is a little bit scary. It's exciting, but scary. I mean, listen, we're in the business of journalism, facts and accuracy. So, <laughs> so anytime anything is fabricated uh, to create facts, I have a problem with that. Um, not when it's puppies, but, um, but, but you know, you never know when it goes, where it goes, where this technology yeah, well, can lead. puppies to, you know, Donald Trump hugging yeah. Vladimir Putin, yeah. easy to imagine. And even for those of us who are not fans of either Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin, Scary. I mean, I choose images every day that go out on the nation's website and, you know, they come from wire services or from Getty, from photographic image banks. And you want to know where they come from and you want to know when they were taken and you want to be able to trust them. Indeed. And trust is a yeah. big issue. Yes. I mean, you see images popping up on social media. I mean, we're looking at these puppies right now. They're cute. They look, they're cute. <laughs> they're and authentically they look cute. <laughs> <laughs> they're not authentically dogs, but they're, but they're factually, authentically cute. They're factually <laughs> unreal, yeah. right? And, and that's an issue. And, 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 you know, one of my fears is, uh, you know, with, with, with teaching is, did my student do this work or did ChatGBT write it? And I think, uh, you know, the more we move forward with technologies alike, we need systems in place to regulate. Um, and, and I do you have those systems to support you now. You know, there are softwares where we can run. You know, to to, to get ideas. That's, that's plagiarism, plagiarism spotting, right? Not, not, not ChatGPT. Yeah. yeah, we have. I mean, we don't. <laughs> no, there are no softwares, pretty much. <laughs> and and ChatGBT doesn't write well enough to get published in the nation yet, but, you know, someday... But my students can get away with it sometimes, <laughs> with, with, with a few assignments. But again, I think the, uh, what, I, what I like to emphasize, though, is, is the need for rules and regulations, right? So 20, 30, 50 years from now, um, we don't have the same issues that we have, for instance, when talking about Meta and X and everything else that's going on on, you know, the world uh, wide web that we don't know what to do with. Right? Well, that's, but that's, isn't that also part of our failure generally to regulate <laughs> these huge companies that do this? I mean, that that is a whole other conversation. <laughs> we will make sure when we do have that conversation, right. we get you back on. Don, Tara, thank you so much for, you. for joining us Pleasure. this evening. Now, uh, before we leave you, uh, let's bring you one more story. The Africa Cup of Nations wrapped up this week and saw host nation Ivory Coast bring home the trophy after beating Nigeria 2-1. According to the Confederation of African Football, nearly two billion people watched the tournament. But one of the biggest stars has turned out to be not one of the players, but a young Gambian photographer who went with her national team to the games. Well, one of only a few female photographers to take uh, pictures at the Cup of Nations, Sajo Balde uh, was uh, pitch side at every match uh, Gambia played. Uh, Sajo uh, joins me now. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. And as we said, I mean, you know, there there have been pieces that have come out about you. Uh, just a really inspiring story of what you've been able to achieve. Oh, I think we're going to try and get your we're, we're going to try and get your uh, audio back. Sajo, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I was just saying how inspiring your story has been. Uh, I am very honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me. And I would say the Africa Cup of Nations was really a storytelling for me, and I have learned a lot in this um, tournament. And I have seen a lot of people wrote about me, the work that I have been doing there, and it is so inspiring, and it has challenged me to even work harder and make everyone proud. And I'm glad that I represented Gambia well, and each and every Gambian is proud to have me in the Africa Cup of Nations. One of the things that, that you have said has been, you know, the, the fact is that you've had to really kind of fight for your way through the, the, the media scrum and the pack and the photographers to, to find your, your spot. Just tell us a little bit more about that. So, yes, um, the most interesting part of it is uh, when we are taking the squad pictures of the boys. Um, so I am, used, I am really small, so we have to be struggling. I have to struggle with the other photographers to be able to take my pictures. 
And it is mostly where the competition is because we are having limited time to be able to take the squad pictures of the national teams. So I have to be like I have to be really quick and be able to do take the picture. Sometimes I'll have some cameras hit my head, but I know what I want. So I just have to be fast in it and just take the pictures and rush out. Yeah, I mean, you say you're small, but but to us, you you look you know great and and big and and those colourful headscarves uh, which you wear, which really help you stand out. But you're you're only a handful of of, of women doing this, um, you know, in Africa. You're also hoping uh, to to get to the World Cup. Yes. Uh, the World Cup is one of my biggest dreams, and getting to the World Cup is going to be a life-changing experience for me. Um, I'm working towards that right now by attending photography lessons, and also I hope I get sponsorship for it because I know it's going to be really expensive. Even though if FIFA, I have my accreditation in FIFA, I'll still need my support because even when I have to go to the Africa Cup of Nations, I have to rent um, some cameras and lens because I don't have a very professional support yeah. by myself. So I have to risk it and rent it well, well, from other we, photographers who will be able to cover the yeah. stunning pictures. Well, well we, we wish you all the very best. Uh, that's it from me and the team here on The World. Goodbye for now.